I encountered Jim Carter about 18 years ago through a really bizarre set of circumstances. I was writing a book at the time about the history of physics and religion and I used to buy a lot of second-hand academic books from this book dealer in LA. And one day I was in there picking up some stuff and she said, oh Margaret, this package arrived in the mail the other day, I was about to chuck it into the bin when I thought of you. And she handed me this package and in it was this amazingly sort of fluorescent coloured wall chart which sort of presented this alternative explanation of the periodic table on the back side of the chart. It had this guy's alternative theory of the creation of the universe. And I thought, my gosh, that's pretty amazing. I've never seen anything like that. This guy was announcing the self-publication of his own book called The Other Theory of, Phys of Physics, in which he was purporting to present to us a complete alternative theory of the universe. He was completely throwing out relativity and quantum theory, and he was presenting his own physics, really, that he built from the ground up. And Jim isn't alone, because actually, I now have a collection of these people. Jim, my guy, Jim Carter, has a, is a very unusual case because he has so much physics and he does these incredible diagrams and animations of his theories. But I actually have been collecting this stuff for about 15 years and I've got, you know, two large shelves on my bookcase full of alternative theories of the universe. And it turns out these guys have their own association. It's called the Natural Philosophy Alliance and they have annual meetings and people come from all over the world and they publish this proceedings which has about you know 700 pages thick of alternative theories of the universe and I became intrigued what does this outpouring of what I've come to call outsider science say about our society's relationship to science in general I don't actually think that any of the people that I've met have actually got theories that are ever going to be taught at Harvard or Princeton. I don't think they're ever going to win the Nobel Prize, and nor do I think they should. What they are doing is, as it were, they are a reaction to the fact that the mainstream physics theories have got so difficult to understand. Things like general relativity and string theory and hyperspace theory, these incredibly beautiful, elaborate, but highly mathematical, highly technical theories that physicists are now saying this is how we describe the ultimate nature of reality. These theories have become inaccessible to almost everybody. I mean, even most trained physicists have a pretty hard time understanding string theory. In fact, most trained physicists will tell you that they really don't understand it. So where does that leave the ordinary person? One of the big issues that's confronting our society now with theoretical physics is that there are so many competing theories of physics, both in mainstream physicists and, in, and from outside the mainstream. Part of the issue is going to be how are we as a society going to work out which theories we'll pay attention to and indeed which theories we're going to spend lots of money testing. And one sees this playing out now vis-a-vis -vis string theory it becomes a practical economic question. How, how much is our society going to spend on searching for true theories of reality? And how are we going to decide among all the competing theories which ones we're going to put our vast instruments to work searching for? Our society spends hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on these. There should be some gatekeeping going on here. But when anyone can post their theories online, as these guys can do now, and the internet has been the biggest boom in the world to outsider theorists, you know, you can go online and, and find thousands of alternative theories of the universe. How are we going to judge? One of the hallmarks of the Enlightenment is that, you know, in the last two or three hundred years, we've, as it were, given people the means of production in all sorts of ways that were unthinkable in the past. So, for instance, in the 18th century, almost nobody would ever hear um, an orchestra play. Almost no one would even hear a violin play. But now anyone can download samples of the London Philharmonic and create a symphony in their own bedroom. In the 16th century, almost nobody could read, let alone write. And now anyone with a laptop can write their own book and actually publish it online. We applaud this, as it were, expansion of the means of production and the DIY culture. Like here we are at the Big Think making our own fantastic television program. And we, we all think this is a good thing. So part of what I'm asking in this book is where do we draw the line with the DIY ethos? Is it unacceptable to have a DIY theory of physics?